Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, this marks the beginning of a new series that we're calling DC Cares. And we're still developing this as we go, but the idea of DC Cares is to produce some different short videos, a series of videos on a variety of just very practical topics. Um, some of these things will have to do with our spiritual life. Many of these will just have to do with the uh, the day-to-day -day living it out. And this first series that we're doing is going to be aimed toward people who are caretakers, uh, and specifically those who are caring for family members, loved ones, who are dealing with some phase of dementia. Uh, this became uh, kind of heavy on my heart over the last couple of years because I have watched numerous families begin that journey and walk through it and, and realize that oftentimes as they start into that journey, they're just not sure where to go, what to do, not even aware of some of the resources that are available in our community. And certainly as a church family, we provide support for each other, we provide love and prayer and compassion, uh, but we know that when you're caring for someone like this, uh, there are other resources that you need to help you on the journey. And so over the next uh, several episodes in this, uh, I hope to introduce you to some of the resources that are available. And if this is your story, I trust that this will be helpful to you. Or if you know someone who is going through this experience, that maybe this is something that you can share with them to be a help to them as well. Uh, today, to get us started, I have with me Dr. David Rogers. And Dr. Rogers is a part of our congregation. And uh, you, you actually just retired, right? Yes, I okay. did. Okay, all right. But you've had a long career in medicine, and specifically you've done quite a bit in geriatric medicine, haven't you? Tell yes. me a bit about your background. Uh, I've been in medicine for probably 35, 40 years, and I've been teaching in family medicine residencies for the past 25 to 30 years uh, back in Michigan. And then the Lord very clearly brought us here about seven years ago, and I've been in practice at Jamestown uh, Family Medicine Center. And um, both my interests back in Michigan ended up uh, gravitating much more toward the elderly. And then also here in Squim, um, I found that, in fact, it is an elderly population. So my practice was uh, quite elderly, and that's right. fine, but I love that. All right, so lots of experience. <laughs> um, I think we've already filmed, I filmed some other segments for this series already, yes. and, and in that, uh, oftentimes I have just said Alzheimer's when talking mm -hmm. about this. But when we talk about these kinds of diseases, Alzheimer's is just one among many, isn't it? Yes. So we just call them the dementias. Well, the dementia is sort of an umbrella term that refers to all of the different kinds of memory issue problems fall under that. Alzheimer's disease is by far the most common. It's about 60% of people that will be affected with dementia will have Alzheimer's disease. But there are other forms, frontal, frontal temporal dementia. There's a couple others that are less common. Um, but Alzheimer's is by far the most common, again, about 60%. And dementia is a, it's a, a change in memory, change in behavior, change in ability to uh, take care of oneself self where it's starting to begin to affect daily living. Okay. And that, I guess that brings something up because all of us, as we get older, <laughs> find that we don't, you know, remember the name quite as quickly as we did. We yes. can't find the word we want sometimes. Um, if someone is watching this and they're thinking, boy, my, my spouse or my parent or my friend, I, I kind of wonder, you know, where's that line between just forgetting some stuff and maybe we need to talk to a doctor and see if there's something else going on. How do you kind of decide that it's time to get some professional input? All right. Obviously, if an, uh, any of the dementias has progressed <clears throat> extensively, then there's not a lot of questions. It's at the very early stages, where is this just dementia? Is this normal aging? So I think from what I have seen, what I have read and understand, I think normal aging brain, our processing speed slows down. So we can't access information that we 
want to remember names or words or other things like that. We can't access that as quickly as we can. A very crude sort of test is if you later on can remember that name or come up with that thing, often that just means normal sort of aging. And that is on a spectrum, so some people are sharp as can be at age 80 or 90, and other of us are already struggling to find the remote or other things like that, you know, at age 60. Okay. So it is a continuum. There is also a, a condition called uh, mild cognitive impairment, where some people have just some very, very mild changes in memory. Uh, it's, so they're not functioning quite as high level, perhaps, as they were before. But mild cognitive impairment, it just, it's a name for this very early stage. Um, and many people can pass out, very few people will progress out of that into dementia, some will, but many people will not go any further than that or might actually improve. To try to sort that out, there is some very simple testing that can be done in the office, just a series of questions. It's something that we, there's several different tests or sets of questions that you can use that can help us just sort of understand where somebody's function and ability to remember things is and where they're, where they're at. So it's something I would say, yes, if there's any question, earlier is better and seek care from a professional. Okay. Uh, now let's say that someone has come in to see their doctor. He's run them through those simple tests and the answer comes back yeah, I see signs of some type of dementia in early mm -hmm. stages. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that that just people kind of freeze at that point. What, what does that mean? Right. What would you say to someone who is maybe that, maybe that caretaker, it's their spouse or their parent, and, and they're kind of grappling with what does this all mean? What would you say to them with, with that early diagnosis? Right. Uh, I'd make sure that that was not just an opinion, that there were some kind of testing done and a standardized test. There's several things that could be done. Also, there's some medical workup that we usually do to try to make sure that this is not an undiagnosed low thyroid or some other conditions that are not uncommon. Depression can uh, imitate uh, dementia to some degree. So often, uh, so you need to make sure there's not another underlying problem. Um, also, we can find some of these things together. So somebody who knows that they're having some issues with their memory, they may start to even become a little bit depressed about that, and a little bit withdrawn. So sometimes it can be multi-factor things going on. So first I just make sure that the diagnosis has been made. And then after that, I would just assess where that person is. And we sort of put dementia into a mild and a moderate and a severe stage. And uh, the severe stage, I think all of us can think of people or things that we've seen, but the vast majority of people are going to be here diagnosed at the very mild stage. And in the mild stage, most people are able to still function independently. They're still able to take care of themselves, do their activities of daily living. It may be safe for them to drive, maybe, maybe not, but it can be safe. Um, often at this point, the person only really needs some help with perhaps schedules or perhaps um, finances. So having the diagnosis early then does not mean that you're going to be 24 seven caregiving, that person's going to need some help at that point, but it's not going to be, um, usually going, not going to be a very heavy burden or a heavy role. I would also tell people that the course is quite variable and some people can progress rapidly, but many people do not progress rapidly. So Alzheimer's disease is not a, I'm going to lose mom or my father in three months or six months. Often it will take a longer period to progress. Everybody is different, the rate that will happen. And there are medications that can slow that progression. So in that early or middle phase, you can still have some very, very quality time with the person. As time goes on, they will require more help or more aid, but at that early phase, not so much. So in that early phase, uh, they're living at home, they're independent, probably being helped by family. Yes. Um, as things progress, what do you see as the breakdown between people who are uh, cared for by family in home versus needing to be uh, in a place with more nursing, full-time nursing care? 
The statistics I've seen, and I think I've also seen it in my practice, the numbers I've seen quoted is that uh, people who require long-term medical care, mostly for dementia, but for other things, probably 80% of those people are having that care provided at home. Okay. And, and that 80%, 90% of that care is being provided by family or extended family or friends of family who are taking care of the, helping with care of the patient. So much of this is going to happen at home, but much of this can be done at home very safely. Um, at that very furthest stage where we may have some behavioral problems or have problems with wandering, or if the spouse, perhaps the spouse is not able physically to actually do the care for the person, uh, the, the person who has the, the dementia, they might require uh, institutionalization, being in a care facility. But there's also a lot of other things that we can have in the home that can help. Um, so there, are, there is the option of visiting nurse. That's something that as things progress, we may be able to use visiting nurse. If you can plug in with, um, there are some volunteer groups that can help uh, and give support. There are some groups that you can pay to have a nurse or nursing staff come in and do some simple caregiving or do you know baths or showers a couple times a week. Um, as you had mentioned to me uh, another time, there are some respite programs where you can um, have your uh, your family member go, the affected person go during the day to give a break for the caregiver. Yeah, and we're going to actually have some other segments in this series. We're bringing in some of those people, those resources. Uh, so you'll get some more information if you're following this series about some of the local resources we have here that I think are tremendously helpful. Oftentimes, the caretaker, especially if it's a married couple, uh, getting up in years and uh, so the caretaker is not a young person themselves and this is a progressive uh, disease and so the care demands kind of gradually get greater and greater and I have seen those places where the caretaker really is overwhelmed yes. but but they're not even recognizing it themselves necessarily that yes. that they need more help uh, what are maybe some some things a person could check in themselves to say, am I doing okay or do I need to get some help here? When you are in the middle of it and if you don't have other people giving support, it can be very difficult to understand how, how, how all-encompassing this can become. And the family member is, wants to provide wonderful care for them. And of course, we, nobody else can do it as good as we can care for our own family members. Um, but that, because I would liken this more to a marathon rather than a sprint, this is something that we need to plan forward for the next few years. So the person really needs to sort of pace themselves. So being involved with the care, but also calling on for help. And often having somebody else coming in and giving some respite or involving family members, involving children, if there are community organizations, if there's church, if there's other groups that can do, they can help the caregiver get some breaks. Having uh, the caregiver needs to stay connected with other people. It can be very easy to get tunnel vision and just focus in on caring for that family member and everything else. You put it aside because this is the most important duty you have. Yes, but we also can get help from others and having connections with others keeps us in balance and they can often help us recognize if this is becoming overwhelming because the caregiver or the care provider is a, another term, they also can suffer same the same things like depression. You know, they can get the isolation. Um, so the isolated and silent, I think the isolated and invisible army is another name I have seen given to the care providers, the families and others, the isolated and invisible army. So it is, a, it is, there's a large number of people doing this, but we don't have to do this alone. So having help from others helps balance, making sure we're taking care of ourselves with our own health, we're getting exercise, we're eating, 
There's just advantages to getting a break for an hour or two a day, um, working around the schedule of a person with dementia, but also having time to go and, and do shopping or to do a Bible study and just get away into fellowship with some other people. That is not bad care for the family member. It's very good care for the care provider. And then you're going to be able to and be able to go longer in the marathon and be healthier as time goes on. Yeah, and you know, I've seen where sometimes, I think one of the factors that causes people to isolate is there is this certain sense of stigma that my, my loved one is losing capability and in wanting to protect them, I, I don't want other people to know. I, I've, I've watched that kind of, you know, covering, protecting, um, which is which is noble and and is certainly coming out of a, a place of kindness and care but sometimes in not being willing to talk about what is going on we also are isolating ourselves from the very kinds of support that we need and I guess that's one thing I would say that if if you're in this situation you are a care provider for someone um, try to find two or three people that you feel safe to let them know how you're doing, what's going on, because you need that support. You need people to come alongside you. And so yes, love your loved one well, but as you're saying, the caretaker needs to be taken care of as well. Um, you know, a couple of books I thought I would just mention. Um, this one is called The Complete Guide. Uh, the, the Complete Family Guide to Dementia, Everything You Need to Know to Help Your Parent and Yourself. It's written by Thomas Harrison and Brent Forrester. Uh, this appears to be a, a pretty good comprehensive resource, so this might be something people would want to check out. Um, another one that is written from, and, and this is not necessarily a Christian book, it's just good information. Uh, another one that is written from a Christian perspective is called Between Life and Death, a Gospel-Centered Guide to End-of-Life Medical Care. And although it's talking about end-of-life issues, and as you said, dementia is, can be a very long thing. It's not necessarily we are nearing the very end of life. But this covers a lot of very practical issues in terms of uh, medical care directives and courses of treatment and I just found it a very helpful book, very practical book, but also written from um, a very gospel-centered understanding by a Christian doctor. Mm -hmm. So I would just mention these as two resources you might want to check out. And I believe you've given us some other things as well that we uh, have scanned and they will be available in the notes on this video. People can link to that to get some more resources. Okay. I was just looking through some of my notes before. The Alzheimer's Association of America is excellent for the uh, information they have online. There is some information just about sort of the stages of Alzheimer's disease. There's also some um, information for caregivers that are particular for early and middle and sort of late stage Alzheimer's disease. Now, the person we're talking about may or may not have Alzheimer's disease, but all these caregiving tips and things would be true for any of the dementias. Okay, that's good. Well, I think that will wrap us up. I really appreciate you giving us some time. And I trust that you'll be able to watch uh, the other episodes in this series because we are going to talk to a variety of people uh, in our local community and I think some really helpful resources. So, thanks for joining us.